I'm Faye, I'm a software developer, and this talk is titled JavaScript, Hardware Even Lib, and it's about creating and consuming third-party libraries in JavaScript. It's mostly about creating them, and as a side effect, about consuming them too. And it's also for everyone, meaning that it's both for people who have never done it, but also for people who did it and want to be reminded why they hated it. Um, I think this covers everyone because I never heard anyone saying that they really loved the process of making JavaScript libraries. But yeah, if you know, just let me know. And uh, yeah, the reason why, th this is a list of reasons why I'm interested in this topic. First of all, it's because I think it's quite disregarded compared to how much attention it's given nowadays to making develop, developer experience better uh, when it comes to full-fledged applications. Um, yeah, I, I think it just doesn't get enough attention. Um, it's because the information that's available, it's partial, meaning that there is no central exhaustive source of, or tutorial that would tell you how to do this. Um, and I think that's quite that's quite normal because you may be you, you may have perfectly marketable skills and have never done it. Um, yeah, I think it's because it's very important for open source, meaning that it's not just a, it's not something that you can dodge, like a piece of knowledge that you can dodge if you want to get in sor in, involved with open source. <laughs> And because although I like to think of all JavaScript libraries as open source, uh, I know that's not always possible. Uh, but even if you are working at your company and you can't get involved that much with open source, there are still technical benefits to it. Because um, being able to split your code base into different chunks that you can then reuse over projects leads to actually better code bases. So into the more technical part of the talk is, um, yeah, if you've never done it or so, but even if you've done it other times, you may be wondering where to start. And uh, you may be tempted to start with a scaffolder. Um, what I have to say about this is that I don't know any source that's official enough, if something can be even official in the JavaScript world. But yeah, I, I, I don't know of any source that's that, that you could possibly trust that I would recommend. But at the same time, at the same time, um, I would not recommend doing that simply because second point is that you are very likely going to be very much responsible of your own library um, for uh, the consumers. And they will be expecting you to be to, to know exactly what what's happening in your library. And yeah. Uh, for the sake of not making a fool of yourself, you should know what is in there. Um, yeah, and um, I think how you start by creating your library is, uh, well, you may already have all the JavaScript, but for starting to think about how to make a third party library out of it would be understanding how to distribute it. And um, I think there are two main ways, like that you can combine them and mix them up and everything, but I think um, either you want a bundle or not. So the bundle, for instance, would be feasible for small libraries. Uh, what you're going to do with it is output in just one file. Uh, one of the benefits, I would say, is that it's going to be possible to use directly in the browser via a script tag or required JS if you're still into that. And it's that it's probably you probably want to minify it uh, that's not exactly like the modern approach to it but still you may be required to do so because um, maybe some co uh, consumer wants to add um, widgets and they want to do it via script tags and yeah what I can say about it is that module bundlers can come to the rescue in this case um, in this case webpack I know about webpack probably other ones I don't know um, in this case, this is a piece of configuration for Webpack. You would um, define the name of your library. With the library target, you will define the module definition that you want for your library. This will eventually create a bundle. 
Um, in this case, U is UMD. You can't go wrong if you want to do what I mentioned before, but you can use other module de modules definitions too. And uh, yeah, the externals are really important. It's basically also what you do with peer dependencies in your packet JSON. You are um, taking things out of the bundle this way. So you are, it's what, those are the dependencies whose control is given to the consum consumer. So you will be assuming that the consumer is going to uh, take care of installing these dependencies. For Webpack, you have to define um, each single case. It doesn't work like that if you're expecting this to, to be included um, in another Webpack bundle. But in case you want it with UMD, this is how you would do it. So the more modern approach, I would say, is with no bundles. And as this would, this is more suitable for complex libraries. So your lib also will probably consist of multiple multiple files, and uh, you're gonna be under like you're gonna do the library under the assumption that it's gonna be used as a dependency in another bund with another bundler. Um, and there are some things that you have to take care about, which are the usage specs. And uh, yeah, it's also very likely going to be used to, uh, going to be installed with a package manager, Yarn, NPM, and hopefully nothing else. Uh, yeah. Um, so you will have to make it installable in this sense. I have taken as an example in the next slide this library, the React Router Redux. You don't really have to know what it does, but I think it's small enough and uh, very straightforward to show what's going on and how it's distributed. Um, so you will see that the source and the lib. Oh, uh, also, I'm under. I'm also assuming that nobody will actually want to distribute the source. Like you can actually have it among the files that you're going to distribute, but you're probably not going to have it as entry. Um, and so the lib looks, as a matter of fact, very similar, and that's kind of the point. Then you're gonna you're gonna want to think about the usage spec. This is uh, the way that um, React Router Redux um, suggests you to to use it. Um, and below you see the index of this library. So you and and uh, yeah, above is the way you would include it in your own application, and you would structure it this way. And below you see also how you would behave if you wanted to rename these functions. And the reason why you can do that is because the index is actually exporting all these functions. Um, so yeah, you may in case you want to allow people to use named imports, you would do it this way. Um, you can see. The last line of the index exports the router middleware from middleware. So um, the library itself internally is using the other kind of uh, imports, which are default imports. Um, with default imports, yeah, that's how you would include the middleware file, for instance. This is not really recommended in the documentation. It's just to show that you may be doing it so. Uh, you would define the path to the file, and this is the content of the file. And you can, as you can see, a default is export, exported. You could also call it directly however you want. You could call it whatever middleware, because you like the sound of it. And, uh, and yeah, that's instead how you would, you would use default imports. Yeah, it's important to notice that even like this is, may look prettier, but uh, many bundler, module bundler, even Webpack one, uh, wouldn't know. For instance, if you're just importing two functions from, from this, um, you would still be having all these functions that are exported in the in index into your bundle. So that's why you may maybe want to give both, both opportunities, like both possibilities to include it. And you may want to also document them. Uh, although, well, with, with Webpack 2, you don't have this problem anymore because um, it uses optimization, it uses tree shaking for optimizing. So you will make sure that you will still just have the functions that you're actually importing in your hosting application files. 
So yeah, the other important step is to make it installable. If you want to install it with NPM or Yarn, you can still rely just on this magical piece of work that is the package JSON, because we discovered backwards compatibility finally, and that's awesome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, this is still the React Router Redux. What's important to notice, it, notice here is the name and the version are the only compulsory fields. The main is the, um, the entry of your distributed files. And it's also the reason why you can just use the namespace with the first example with name imports. And you have to use the entire path with the default imports. Um, yeah, you can use the, the files. Is actually just the files that you're going to have um, in the distribution. Eventually, you also probably know npm ignore. You can combine the two. They do more or less the same. And uh, yeah, it's also very important to notice, to notice the scripts. Um, this library um, is going to be converted into CommonJS. Um, also, what they're doing is also providing the UMD inside another folder, which is this. Um, so as a matter of fact, you can do both, but there will still be one major way to, to include it. And in this case, it's, um, yeah, it's with, within um, your application to be bundled later. And the prepublish script actually runs all of this uh, before you publish an NPM. Yeah, which is pretty cool. So uh, some considerations about style. I mean, there will be so many things to say, but I, I just need to talk about the essentials here. Um, anyway, if you're thinking about also uh, distributing styles, you may, be want, you may want to use the CSS modules. Um, and that's a good choice. You, you may do that. Just know that it is, um, by now, I think, still an overhead for the consumer because you will have to tell them that their bundler have to understand CSS modules. And um, yeah, my, uh, yeah, my recommendation would be that you can use whatever processor you like, but it would be nice to distribute compiled files. Um, not al also, if you're doing this um, inside your own company and you have already agreed on a preprocessor, it's possible that this will make your library age faster. Um, and if you decide to go away from that preprocessor, you're going to still have in your bundler, um, that, that you're going to still have in hosting applications uh, things that need to understand uh, what the, what the preprocessor you want to use is. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And then you may ask yourself where to put it. You can actually do it, like put it on GitHub and uh, make it installable, installable via GitHub. And this would mean that you're going to have built files in your repo. You can publish it on NPM. And if it's public, it's going to be available also under this. Uh, the, the raw files are going to be available under this URL. You can use any CDN you want for, for bundles, really. Uh, yeah. It's yeah, almost at the end, but I think this is very important, is that I think there's still the misconception that one library has to coincide with one repo, and that's not true. <laughs> um, you may have seen around lots of repos with multiple packages. Um, Babel is an example for this. Um, and uh, this has many benefits. It's easier for testing, so it's easier if you don't want to redo your testing environments for every single package. And it's good for a shared configuration. And it's also a good idea if uh, the, the packages are, um, are going to be used together. So you can try them in a playground, for instance, more easily. And there are many tools that make this process much smoother. For instance, Lerna. Um, I don't really know about others by now. Uh, yeah, but there may be others. Um, it has some drawbacks, uh, so I guess NPM has some incentives in having you publish on NPM. So 
this is going to be impossible to install with GitHub because the assumption is that you have one package and uh, it just looks into the root folder. So you can't just go deeper inside your, inside your repo. Um, and the, the point is many other tools may be working under this assumption. The other one I know of is Greenkeeper, for instance. So yeah, just keep it in mind if you want to use any of that. Yes, <laughs> fortunately, some days ago, I read something inspiring that I could put at the end of my talks. And <laughs> it's a very nice blog post, which is called Are We Making the Web Too Complicated? And I, I found it very comforting because uh, if you're JavaScript developers, most likely you've heard that, like you've been accused of wanting to make things more complicated because that's cool and fun. But yeah, <laughs> that's probably the, the, right, the real reason why you do it. Yeah, and uh, the end is just about reads and sources. Done. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, let, let's go to the end first. Um, would it be the case if you have a package which you can publish uh, globally? Because uh, um, you mean the company and it's public? Can you, you, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. So you mean what do you do in case you cannot publish your package publicly? Uh, yes, you can do it with. Uh, uh, in the beginning. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You can have an NPM enterprise account. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to sponsor. Um, or you can also do it uh, with a um, private GitHub account. If you have the right to include that package, then you can in install it normally as you would um, with public um, GitHub repos. It just basically like a library or something on GitHub which you yeah. want into your project, either sub modules or something, right? Yeah. You can install it's, it. You can, you can specify. Yeah. It. Yeah. Right. It's just a matter of permission. Yeah. It's just a matter of permission. You can even so. specify dependency inside the project, so it shouldn't be even in a separate repository. So you can even just specify a path to this dependency where package JSON is a local module, right? Located. Mm -hmm. So you just, let's say you want to have it. As a uh, all right, that's true. Because you want to use it a multiple project. Yeah, so then, then that would make sense to have it. Um, yeah, so then you can project. use like uh, URL to to the package. But yeah, don't do it. <laughs> just don't so, just don't it. Yeah, it's like it's messy. Yeah, yeah. it's a mess. At, at, at the point where you start to uh, like um, where you introduce the CI CD system, yes, you have a huge problem because now you have to, to have a GitHub log yeah. in your CI CD system that has access to libraries and, and everything gets really crazy. Yeah. So, so it's a mess. You can get very creative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess. So, yeah. Oh. Some you don't need I, I forgot about that. You can, yeah. you can specify the, the <laughs> right when you URL. mix and was like the least bad thing, let's say. <laughs> yeah, then it's like monorepo, probably the yeah, best choice for you. Line. Yeah, and use like a uh, path, like, like relative path to, to the library. Have you ever used uh, NPM Enterprise? Yes. Really? Wow. You're probably the first person I know who's yeah. used it. But it's the, um, yeah, it's... Is it good? Like, what does uh, it do? Should I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was not the it was not the best experience with uh, really organizations and users and everything and permissions. Yeah, it's it's a bit painful. Maybe it, it could be better. Yeah, maybe it, maybe it'll get better. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so cool. definitely not gonna use that. <laughs> so what would be? I, see, I, see the I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My question is not answered. Yeah. Um, just try to figure yeah. out yeah. what, like, just um, think. Also have a Nexus or an directory and publish the package to this private Nexus. Only you in your company have access to this Nexus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's 
consideration. So I would say there's not a really straightforward good solution. It's not. I think I have okay. to stay with someone. Yeah. You can just pass them during beers. Yeah, that's a real problem. It's great to drink beers. Uh, I can promise it will stay unfinished. <laughs> Go ahead. I think this would be a good question for, for the React community here. You probably remember when React DOM got separated from React for a very good reason as, as packages. How many of you are actually using the compiled version of, of React in your projects? Anyone? No. It's script hacking. No. Yeah? Oh, yeah. I mean, you can do it. I think this is a very good point. Yeah, you can do that. I, I, but I never heard of any. Community, it, it's yeah. very popular to, to use it as, as a module. But it might not be true for every single package out there. Oh no, I think it will. Um, so I think um, if you usually require the hosting application to install its own React and you do not ship it. So yeah, that's that's what I think. Like I, I never knew anyone would include it that way. But it's also it's an interesting point because actually, like if you remember, um, it was there five years ago or six years ago, the jQuery time, um, you got jQuery from the CDN, which was actually cool because it was cached, and now everybody wants to use React with their own application, which is completely unnecessary actually. Um, so I think there is room for opportunity to actually go back to that whole system where we say like, HDI external dependencies, and you just have this script pack, and it's 99% of the time cached. I said you, you probably loaded React from some other website you visited. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cached yeah, Unpackage, for example. I mean, I do you know like who runs Unpackage? No. Okay. So yeah, I'm not sure if I would trust it then. But <laughs> oh yeah, I mean you could include it, but like you could also tell people to include your library via script tag by using that URL. I guess. Yeah. Um, one note: there is. I'm not sure if this is public. Is this, if this is public, but Jan is going to add a feature which is called Workspaces. Um, so they basically build a learner competitor, uh, or like a comp probably like it should play the learner eventually. Okay. Um, so and the according to them, it's going to be really good. Okay, are they like are they collaborating for this or is it just their own thing? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they're collaborating. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Because Lerna is pretty cool, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think the Lerna guy actually created the arm, so <laughs> no. Partly, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, no surprise there. <laughs> Uh, I have a question about like, yes. uh, delivering styles to the client. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention uh, any of like CSS and JS solutions. Do, do you even think it's a feasible option, or you think it's like it's not something we should do or explore even? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, I think it could be explored. I I have no strong opinions when it comes to styles. I have to say, so I don't know. I also use that. Uh, when I had to. <laughs> yeah. I, I used um, like style in JavaScript, as you're mentioning, but yeah, I don't have strong opinions about that. You mean, like, in React, like a style tag, or you use Glamour? Or uh, like stuff? JSS. Okay. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. No question? Yes. Uh, so, in your second approach, where you um, you sort of make uh, separate fund, uh, modules in mm -hmm. your library artifact, right? You, where users can import individual parts of the library. I didn't expect that, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have to unplug it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is the. Um, <laughs> What is the compilation target for, for these JavaScript files? Do you still produce ES5, or would you go to mm. ES6 and then expect the consumers to consume ES6? No, I, um, so I think still most, um, the, the thing you would do is still um, compile to CommonJS, um, especially if you're expecting it to work in Node. So. That's also what the React Router Redux in this example does. Um, although Webpack 
I think would work anyway, but it, it, you just can't expect that everyone is using Webpack too. Right. So, so it would work, but isn't there a problem with tree shaking? Then? Yeah. Is there, is there any good solution to that? Do you know? I I only heard about people building now. I, what I heard is that people build now, um, and I think we might even do this in one list. Um, like build to ES5 as lib, but then you have um, like an ES2015 version as well, and that I use use already the import statements, mm -hmm. and that's how Webpack can do tree shaking. Uh, you know that. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I was answering some questions. So, yeah, so basically, if, if you if you're writing your library in ES 2015 with imports and exports, you can add a in package JSON, not just a main uh, field, but you can add a I think a JS uh, next thing. next something yeah. JS next main. Yeah, yeah cool. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and you can point to the source of your uh, ES uh, 2015 code, and then. Webpack 2 will automatically pick this one instead of main and will import your uh, statically uh, analyzable import. And this will allow tree shaking because tree shaking only works if you can if you if you use uh, ES 2015 import experts that are statically analyzable. So that's the, that's the whole point of it. And it's I cool. That, I guess in the future it's not going to be like this uh, extra field in the package case anymore. It's going to be this new extension .mjs. Yeah right. Oh probably see, okay. Yeah. Actually, adopt um, what level of language, like what level of ECMAScript you're writing in there, it's more about the module system. Um, but yeah, I don't think this JSNX thing, I don't think that's standard. That's just something that works right now.